One type of content I've always wanted to make on this channel but never really knew where to start with was 007, the James Bond franchise. I loved this franchise, I grew up with it, especially the Brosnan and Craig eras, and Jill and I decided to sit down and watch GoldenEye for the first time together. I've actually seen this movie several times, but Jill has never seen a James Bond movie, and it sort of reinvigorated my interest to talk about this whole franchise overall, so I guess expect to see more Bond videos coming up in the future, because it's something I'd like to be a, I guess I would say, returning staple on this channel. One of the reasons we actually started deciding to watch the movies now is because I saw Pierce Brosnan as Dr. Fate in the new Black Adam movie, and I was so captivated by him and his performance that I thought, wow, I want to see more of him, especially like when he was younger and how he was in the Bond movies. Probably a week or two later, we decided, you know what, let's, let's watch Goldeneye for my first time, and it was very exciting. Yeah, and I have a few things to say about this movie before we start, because I personally think this movie is a very good jumping on point for James Bond. I do think the movies before it are all worth your time, they're all worth watching, and it would be really fun to eventually review all of them. Not sure how long that would take, but it would be very fun to do. Since I want to bring Bond to this channel though, that's kind of a, a future goal for me. But before we start talking about the contents of the movie itself, the impact of the film Goldeneye deserves some discussion. Goldeneye was wildly important and it helped preserve the Bond franchise in general, which was actually under a lot of scrutiny at the time of its release, as there was a question of if Bond could exist outside of the real world Cold War era he was famous for, which had been coming to a close in the early 90s. Goldeneye was set to be released in 1995. Bond was seen as a staple of the Cold War era and his existence outside of it at this point was uncertain. There were also questions of the film's profitability as the three movies preceding it had been all over the place in terms of financial returns, with A View to a Kill coming in at 152.4 million, The Living Daylights at 191.2 million, and License to Kill falling to just 156.1 million dollars. These might actually sound like small fry numbers in the modern day of 2022, but it's worth mentioning that, you know, inflation and everything, I haven't done the math on this, but that was worth a lot more at the time. However, a $40 million drop off was quite a bit. It's also worth noting that License to Kill had actually come out six years earlier than Goldeneye, just at the end of the real world Cold War. And this was the longest gap between Bond movies ever, even longer than the inevitable gap between the release of Spectre and No Time to Die, if only by a few months. Now it's also worth noting that with no disrespect meant to him as an actor or his performances, Timothy Dalton's Bond movie License to Kill, which had directly preceded Goldeneye, was very different in tone than the classic Bond films and many fans had actually lost faith or interest in the franchise by the time Goldeneye was said to be releasing, believing that the franchise was going to be relegated to diminishing financial returns and a diminishing story quality. It didn't help that there were a few clunkers along the way that people really didn't enjoy, including films like Moonraker, even though there are some redeeming elements in that movie as well. While Bond had become known for changing actors over time, Brosnan was not yet a proven James Bond, as this was his first planned outing as the character. Brosnan almost didn't even get to play Bond, though, as he was actually eyed for the role as early as 1987 for The Living Daylights, but he was stuck in a contract to play one of the leads on the television show Remington Steel, a show which I love, by the way, which had been again renewed after public speculation and talk that Brosnan was possibly tied to the role of Bond, as this reinvigorated interest, ratings, and viewership in Remington Steel to possibly be watching the next James Bond actor on television. Brosnan went on to say that he was at the time devastated at being unable to play the character, but things would inevitably work out for him when Goldeneye rolled around, solidifying his spot in Bond history. This movie also went on to affect other mediums, including gaming, and it would spawn the wildly popular Goldeneye 007 video game, which introduced thousands of fans to the Bond character and helped revolutionize and popularize what we now know as the modern 3D first-person shooter genre of video games. FPS games did exist before Goldeneye, it's just worth noting that this game 
really helped popularize them and push that genre forward into the 3D realm, especially with the accessibility of the N64. And GoldenEye is also one of Nate's favorite games, isn't it? GoldenEye Reloaded is one of Nate's favorite games. Oh, okay. Very but, similar name. Yeah, very similar name. Pretty much the same story, but uh, that was kind of the era he grew up with for mm -hmm. Bond. He's slightly younger than me. It's also worth noting, though, that the game 007 GoldenEye would actually go on to usher in an era of Pierce Brosnan Bond video games as well, including Agent Under Fire, Night Fire, and Everything or Nothing, which would continue to capture the hearts of both existing and new fans of the James Bond character for years to come, Brosnan would go on to be synonymous with Bond both in gaming and movies for a very long time. And speaking of that, Jill and I are actually planning to let's play a bunch of the James Bond games over on our channel Degenerate Plays, which is in the description down below. I think near future when GoldenEye 007 is remastered for Xbox Game Pass and Switch, we're going to kind of start there and work our way through some of the Brosnan games and then kind of move into Craig. But very fun video games. I think you were excited for that. I am very, very excited. I really love video games and I'm starting to really like James Bond, even though I've only seen one movie so far. I loved it. And one of your favorite elements was the gadgets, right? Yeah, actually, um, one of my favorite things ever in um, like spy type things is the gadgets and that sort of on the fly, like knowing how to do things, like being kind of macgyver Because one of my favorite scenes in the movie was when he had to work in only three minutes to get himself out of the bullet train with Natalia. Because I just found it so interesting and kind of tense and fun. I always really liked when people in movies kind of have to think really quickly and make something or find a way out of some sticky situation and they do it in some amazing way using some gadget. And that's one thing that I think is one, a staple of Bond, except in a couple of movies and a couple of games, that you will very much enjoy in the franchise. And I think you'll love the video games because of it, because most of the best James Bond games, especially, really make use of those gadgets, which is really, really cool. Gadgets and unique weaponry are Bond staples, along with really just gorgeous women and amazing action scenes. It sounds like you would like the 90s TV show Totally Spies. Oh, uh, well. No. It's like Charlie's Angels, but there are James Bond spies and they're sexy and <laughs> they have gadgets. Well, it sounds like that's something I'm gonna have to be checking out. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth mentioning, you already said this is your first Bond movie. It was actually mine too. That's one of the reasons I wanted to introduce you to Bond with Goldeneye. I'm most familiar with the Brosnan and Craig eras, but we're now also going to be going back to enjoy the previous films. We're gonna work our way through reviewing all of the Brosnan films, then the Craig films, then kind of go back and I, I would say go through order. It's just, I thought that starting at more modern was kind of a good way to introduce you to the franchise. I think it's worth mentioning though, this wasn't the very first time you watched said movie. No, I've seen this movie a bunch of times, but this is where I started with James Bond when I was a child. Yeah. Now, my mom wouldn't let me watch most of them because she was like, there's too much sex and violence. <laughs> but come on, sex and violence are awesome. So well, here else? we are today. They're a big part of who I am. Who else is going to teach you sex and violence? It's got to be TV shows these days. That's a good point. Now, fun fact about this movie, too. The movie's named Goldeneye, and I actually learned this from my friend Seth, who was a former patron and now member over on Degenerate Plays. Big Thank fan. you very much, Seth and good friend. He actually pointed out to me that the movie's name was actually named after Ian Fleming's house in Jamaica where he wrote the Bond books, or at least a lot of them, as his house was named Goldeneye. Again, houses used to have names. That's a pretty cool thing from the past that we kind of dumped. I wish that our house still had names. We should name our house. We should name our house. That's the biggest takeaway from Goldeneye. I thought the plot of this movie was relatively easy to follow. I think you did as well. You had a couple questions when we were going through it, but it's worth you know, saying that you, again, your first Bond movie, you're not used to the tropes, you're not used to the ins and outs and kind of the story structure they were going for. So I think it's pretty common to ask some questions. And there were things I noticed in this movie, this is probably my fifth or sixth time watching it, that I didn't notice until now. Unlike Nate, I am not a history buff. So I didn't know some of the things that they mentioned referencing like parts of the Cold War and referencing some of the Germans and their tensions with um, the British and stuff like that. Like a lot of what Alec had to say was about his family and um, you know people being sent back to Soviet Russia to be executed and I didn't really understand or know a lot about a lot of that so I needed you to kind of explain it to me. Yeah even though this movie is essentially a post Cold War Bond it's still very much dealing with the fallout of the Cold War mm -hmm. and actually Brosnan's time as Bond 
I would say maybe not including Die Another Day. I'd have to rewatch that movie because it's been a while. A lot of his movies deal with some leftovers of the Cold War, which was mm -hmm. an interesting way they were able to transition Bond into more of a modern character. I think it's really cool because I love when they kind of have that backing of real world events, but then they, they kind of switch up what's happening, kind of like the MCU. That's true. That's a good point. <laughs> I do think that with this too, to just kind of very briefly summarize the story, the GoldenEye satellites are weapons developed by the Soviet Union during the Cold War, and once triggered, the satellite would actually detonate a nuclear device in the atmosphere over a given target that would create an electromagnetic pulse, pretty much crippling any and all electronics in the blast radius. This would down airplanes, destroy infrastructure, and even had that capability to render entire economies into disarray by destroying all the data stored on computer servers and drives in the area. Now, you mentioned Alec Jill, mm -hmm. Alec Trevelyan, which I always say his name wrong, uh, Agent 006, and this is where he comes in. I think that he was written very well as a as a character, and I wanted to summarize the political aspect of it for just a second for anyone watching, but then talk to you about it. Mm -hmm. Because one of my favorite parts about it is how it does get into the story and background of the Cold War and events going on at that time, because Trevelyan was born to a family of Lien's Cossacks, and I, I will admit, I'm reading off the Wikipedia because I think they, they summarize the historical information better than I can. Mm -hmm. But following the Second World War, the anti-Bolshevik Cossack Crusades, whom had collaborated with the Germans, fled from the advance of the Red Army. They surrendered to the British Army in Austria, believing they would join them and wage war against the communists. However, the British decided to forcibly repatriate them and their families to the Soviet Union, where many were promptly executed and the remainder were sent to gulags, including women and children. The Trevelyan family survived the ordeal and Alec Trevelyan was born. Shortly afterward, however, his father committed murder-suicide and the movie said he was unable to let himself or Alec's mother live with the shame of it. So it's interesting that he was an orphan kind of mirroring James Bond as well. Mm -hmm. And with that too, he was recruited by MI6 and kind of raised almost into that life in a lot of ways by the British government, sort of learning his history and figuring out what happened along the way and remembering things from his time as a child. Yeah, and he kind of just blamed the entire British government for the bad things that happened to him and his family. Right, essentially he had a very, even though this character is pretty diabolical, and I'm gonna talk about why in a minute here, uh, he had a lot of understandable reasons for why he wanted to use Goldeneye to ruin the UK. I thought his character arc was extremely interesting mm -hmm. because I thought at the very beginning of the movie when I saw him and James Bond being really good friends, I thought it was really interesting that they introduced this friend of his and then they just kind of killed him right away. And I was like, huh, what's the point of that? Just to show like that James can't enjoy anybody in his life and that he can't have any friends or they'll die. Cause he seemed kind of torn up about it. And he even said like, he kind of wanted to get revenge on the people that killed his friend. Yeah, specifically Oromov, he wanted dead. Yeah. And then he found out that it was all a fake and that his friend was never even really his friend. He was a traitor. And it was like this huge twist. And I was like, oh, I wasn't expecting this. I the, didn't expect this guy to come back. I was going to ask you if you were expecting it too, because I tried to avoid telling you or showing you anything about this movie prior to it so that you would be able to enjoy it the same way people did in the past. I think it's, it's too often that going into movies, you know big twists because of just pop culture and, mm -hmm. and everything if you don't see it in the first couple of years. I'm actually really disappointed after having watched the Star Wars movies that I found out that Darth Vader was Luke's dad. Right, which ev pretty much everyone knows. It's not even really a spoiler at this point because it's just, it's everywhere. But if I hadn't known that, I think it would have made the movie a lot more um, interesting for that twist. And I think that's kind of a shame that there's some spoilers that are just so circulated, mm -hmm. you know? When he first showed up on screen as like the kind of villain character, I was like, wait a minute, is that that guy from the beginning? Who is this? What the heck? And you had to pause the movie and explain it to me. Yeah, the fact that he <laughs> is not only running the Janus Corporation crime syndicate, but also is going by that alias, I think was something that viewers weren't really expecting with the movie and with that as well i think it's interesting because there are things i noticed about him as a villain that i didn't notice originally so he is understandable in his motivations however i think they did do a few things with this character that make him a little cartoony and not sympathetic mm -hmm. and what i mean by that is for example 
Yes, I know that sexual assault is a real thing in real life. However, when someone crosses that line, it's a little hard for me to sympathize with the character. So while I understand the motivation of Alec going into his plan with Goldeneye, the second that he kind of implies he's going to rape Natalia and starts kind of kissing on her neck and holding her down and stuff. Now he never goes through with it because the train stopped by James, but it's worth noting that like, I don't, rem I didn't remember that from when I was younger. And I kind of was like, oh yeah. Like a lot of times the Bond villains were like comically evil. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you'd understand why they were evil, but there wasn't enough moral wiggle room to be like, yeah, I side with Alec. You know what and, I mean? And it seemed like he only really wanted to do that because he thought that Natalia and Bond had been in intimate together, which they hadn't been at that point. Right, and so he deserved it. Yeah, so he decided he deserved everything that Bond got because he was kind of jealous of him in a way. Yeah, which is interesting because getting into the psychology of Bond, he's also a very damaged character. Mm -hmm. I actually really like the you know, the, the whole implication of 006 being a traitor. Mm -hmm. It's actually something that also showed that this movie was willing to take risks mm -hmm. because that's not something that they had really gone too far into in previous movies. Essentially, the MI6 agents were the good guys. Mm -hmm. They were the good guys. Yes. And everyone else was the bad guys. I like that um, James Bond was kind of more of a gray area where like he tried his hardest to be a good guy, but he was kind of like the Punisher and he where he's really flawed and he doesn't think of himself as the good guy. And he kind of knows like that someday he's probably going to end up getting himself killed from doing all of this. Mm -hmm. And I just find it really interesting that like he is so willing to try and um, do these good moral things, but he will do anything to get there, even if that involves killing a bunch of people. Yeah, it's it's interestingly done, and you can tell that Bond tries to avoid civilian casualties and things like that as well, but uh, there is a lot of collateral damage in pretty much every version of James Bond's life. He destroyed life. that city with the tank. You cannot tell me that somebody wasn't, like, <laughs> homeless or seriously critically injured after that. Well, now, hold on. He was just the chaser. It's the chasee at fault with that. Uh -huh. You know, speaking of the tank, I want to mention that too because the tank scene was another example of them taking a lot of risks this plays into one critique i think we had with this movie we don't have many i think we both love this movie to me this movie is one of the examples of what i'd call an almost perfect spy thriller yes like i don't i don't sit down and be like here's my 35 critiques of goldeneye I just don't have them. It was one of those movies that kept me really sucked in the entire time. Mm -hmm. I'm somebody who loves movies, and I don't normally get um, too distracted during them. But every once in a while, when there's like a really adult, super serious movie that doesn't have a whole lot of levity and is mostly based on a lot of like history stuff, I kind of get a little bored, and I don't really understand a lot of it. And with this movie in particular, I was kind of thinking, huh, I hope that this isn't just super serious and makes me bored. Mm -hmm. And it was actually so surprisingly really enjoyable. Well, it has a lot of charm built into it too. And to kind of get back to what I was saying too with this, uh, because I, I, you know, I want to let you in when you want to talk too, since you're here too. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention with taking risks though, and the tank scene that you brought up is one, that tank scene is to me, one of the most iconic James Bond scenes of all time, mm -hmm. where he's kind of surrounded by the military and he's looking around and then he turns and you see the camera pan to the tank. And, and then you know what he's thinking. And then the next thing you know, Oromov, uh, General Oromov's car is driving down the road. And it's worth noting Oromov's the one who, you know, inevitably is, is pretty much responsible for stealing Goldeneye and working with Alec, right? I'd, I'd like to circle back around to him after you make your point, by the yeah, way, because well, I got a few things to say about him. Oromov's car is driving down the road at that point, heading to the bullet train where Alec is, but he has Natalia in the car. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you see kind of the camera pan out and then boom, right out of the wall, bursts the tank with classic James Bond music playing. And it's I thought, awesome. The reason you brought up the BMW car in the first place is, oh, because, sorry. is because the tank scene that was chasing the car, that was kind of like the chase scene that is a trope in all the James Bond yeah, movies. Yeah, it kind of like, it was a bit of a bait and switch. We thought the BMW that Q introduced to Bond would play a bigger role. And it, but, he said it had a bunch of gadgets and stuff in it with special buttons, and then you never see any of them be pressed. So I'm not sure if there were any ideas to use the car more. I'd have to look through deleted scenes and other stuff. I do know that, again, my friend Seth, who's more of a 
a James Bond expert than I am, who a lot of times I consult when I'm working on stuff like this just to kind of get his opinion, said that there were going to be some helicopter scenes that end up being more moved and adapted into Tomorrow Never Dies. So I know there were some ideas that they didn't get to in Goldeneye that were moved, but I think the car was an interesting one because it was almost a bait and switch where you're expecting Bond to use this car a bunch. And they made a big deal out of it. Yeah, and he, and then, he ends up not using it. So it's, it's a yeah. weird thing. Like, on the one hand, I'm like, cool, you subverted expectations. But on the other hand, it didn't feel like he picked the tank over the car. It felt like the car just didn't get used. Yeah. Does it, that feel that way to you? It was only in one scene when he was driving down the street with Natalia, and it wasn't an action scene or anything. So I was like, why does he have this, like, supercar with all of these interesting things attached to it and we don't get to see him use any of them and then the american guy jack wade just takes the car and drives off with it yeah essentially he just goes off to joyride with the car for a few minutes and that's that's about it yeah you wanted to talk a little bit about oramont because i want to mention too we didn't talk about a few characters here obviously natalia is the Bond girl of this movie. I think she's one of your favorites that you can speak to more in a minute. Oromov is probably, he's just the weakest character in general. Now, there's no hate to the actor who played him. I thought he did a really good job. I thought he had sort of this menacing, you know, comic book villain presence where he was kind of just this scary bad guy in terms of what he was. But with the twist reveal of Alec being the main baddie, it kind of relegates Oromov to a back seat where he doesn't matter as much, and then he's inevitably killed off, sort of entering the third act of the movie because he's no longer needed at all. Now, I'm glad they cut the loose, or the, the I guess you'd say the loose weight or the, the extra weight on the story and didn't drag along a character that wasn't needed. I do think it would have been slightly more interesting, though, um, because some of his higher ups had a little suspicion against him mm -hmm. and then they never really do anything with that And I think it would have been more interesting if they kind of found out what he was doing and threw him into jail or something like that And he had to be in like the gulag or whatever. Right, no nothing really happens to him except that he's shot yeah. by Bond that, I just think really it would have been it. interesting if, like, the Soviet Russians were like, hey, wait a minute. Yeah, and they don't really get that moment at all. You wanted to talk a little bit about Natalia, because for me, this is a very memorable character. I know a lot of people say Bond girl is degrading now. I really don't give a shit. Uh, that's How what is that the, degrading? That's what the characters have always been called. Um, she, she's a strong, independent. She's really sexy. I don't care if that's... You know, she's not also PC extremely either. smart. Yeah, she's not just eye candy for the audience. And I do think that that is a criticism of some of the earlier Bond girls is they're there for they're they're essentially there for a bang, mm -hmm. both the bang on screen, like in terms of like, whoa, look at that. And also to bang James Bond. Of course. And of that's course. that's pretty much the only reason that a lot of Bond girls in the franchise have been there. I think Natalia, she didn't start the trend of Bond girls contributing to the story that was a thing for a long time but i think she's a really good example of someone who does contribute to the story i really liked that she contributed very heavily to the plot like mm -hmm. you know you're introduced to her before she even meets james bond and in some kind of ways i know this might sound weird but she reminded me of sigourney weaver in alien as she was very independent and smart with technology and was a survivor in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. Um, and I think you kind of get to see that towards the end of the movie when they're about to have that face off with Alec and before she gets uh, kind of restrained by all of these dudes, she's able to change some of the launch codes and stuff. So that way Boris can't get into the system. Yeah, actually Bond would not have been successful without the help of Natalia in this movie. I That's something I like. I thought it was incredible that she did that. Yeah. I thought that they did that very, very well. And she's just, to me, one of the most iconic Bond girls that has ever existed. I think she's one of the best of the Brosnan era at the very least. And I think, like you said, it's kind of too bad that going on past this, they just sort of dropped the character. I know the staple of the franchise is that Bond gets a new girl every movie. Mm -hmm. I understand. I'm not like against that staple. But they acted like they were really in love. Yeah, they acted like there was more going on there than there was. And, yeah. and again, that's also a Bond staple. I mean, there were points where, you know, he was getting married in terms of in the past, in mm -hmm. previous iterations, and there have been other examples of full-on relationships. But when we move into Tomorrow Never Dies, and you kind of just move past this movie, there's really nothing talking about her. I know that 
Um, when reading trivia about this movie, there was originally a throwaway line that she had ended up getting married to someone else, that her relationship with Bond didn't work out. Mm -hmm. That never actually made it into any of the movies. Aww. So essentially, you just kind of are told to move on, uh, which I think that that's not a that's not a criticism of this movie, especially viewing it just as a movie on its own. But for such an important character, I think we deserve closure. Yeah, and unfortunately, you're going to be saying that a lot of the time with Bond girls, because a lot of the time they just kind of go away. That's very sad. And, and it is something that I think the franchise could have done a better job with. I would take some throwaway lines just saying where they go. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they do that and I'm fine with it. Mm -hmm. I think the Craig era does the best job with the women in the James Bond franchise, not by being progressive, but by taking the Natalia formula of giving them a reason to be there mm -hmm. and also being willing to talk about where they go after or mm -hmm. what they do after or even writing them out in certain ways. Mm -hmm. I think that's something I would have liked to see more in from this movie actually come from this movie because if we're going to talk about the importance of the video game and, and the importance of the the movie on the bond franchise and saving it i think it's worth mentioning the importance of that character um and the importance of like the writing following each movie wasn't taken quite as seriously back then because it was such a loose continuity Speaking of strong, independent women who don't need no man, oh yes, <laughs> Anna Top I thought was extremely interesting. I love her. I think she's very hot. First of all, second of all, I really loved this sort of Black Widow character that you at first kind of think is a good guy because you kind of see her in that car at the begin very beginning of the movie, and you think, oh, she's probably gonna be like the Bond girl. He's yeah, gonna, he's gonna have a bunch of sex with her. It's gonna be awesome. And then she's a villain. And not only that, but when she tries to have sex with a bunch of people, she gets off to, like, crushing their ribs and killing them. Yeah, she is very much a, a black widow, lure men to a sense of security and then kill them. And I think even further than that, her sort of sexual violence, I think it has some interesting parallels with the character of James Bond, who is also, again, in a lot of ways, obsessed with sex and violence. The difference is Anna Top mixes them. Like in the in the scene where she actually goes to the facility with Oromov to hijack the first GoldenEye satellite and take the launch codes to the weapon and, and all that stuff, which by the way, there's an amazing replica of the GoldenEye launch device that I want so bad, but I'm not willing to spend $900 on. Regardless, moving on, when she goes there, I think it's worth mentioning that she just straight up kills everyone and climaxes to it. Yeah, she like comes to it. Like yeah. she literally like moans and ton a ton of stuff. Yeah, and Ormov's just like, what the fuck? It, like looking at her. It's kind of weird. <laughs> they do a really odd thing with her, but I think it was really well done because you know, is it weird or, or odd? Yeah, but like this insane level of sadomasochism, you know? Cause there's a lot of people who are interested in that kind of stuff when it comes to like toys and adult fantasies and things. I don't want to go too far down this road because I don't want to get demonetized. And but dangerous women. A lot of men really love women who step on them. Yeah, yeah. All, all of that dominant stuff. I think it was an interesting direction to go with on a top where she was kind of like this insanely cartoonish out of this world version of the, a mixture of all of that stuff. Yeah. Mixed with sort of a femme fatale character. It was awesome. And another one of my favorite scenes in the movie is when you think that Bond is actually going to get to have some fun sex with her. And then they end up fighting because she's trying to kill him and stuff. And he puts her naked butt down on that really hot thing and burns her. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that and was really fun. And slams her against the wall. Yeah. Yeah, and then pulls out his gun and says, no more foreplay. Mm -hmm. I thought, by the way, you know, to kind of get towards the end of this review, the thing, one thing I really love about Brosnan's Bond is he has a sense of sophistication to him, but he also feels down to earth. So he feels very sophisticated. He fits in, in the beginning, you know, playing, uh, playing poker. You know, he fits in there. He fits in at the bar. He fits in with Jack when Jack is trying to fix his shitty car, mm -hmm. you know, on the side of the road. And, he, and Jack is calling him Jimmy. <laughs> yeah, I love when he called him Jimbo. Yeah. He is a very captivating person in general. Like, it's something that I noticed in Dr. Fate. Well, not in the movie, but when he was playing Dr. Fate in mm -hmm. Black Adam, he was so captivating and you couldn't take your eyes off of him and I felt the same exact way in this movie and I'm really excited to watch more movies with him because I think I'm becoming a, a Pierce Brosnan super fan. I really like him. Well, yeah, he was kind of a heartthrob of the 
I would say late or to mid to late eighties and throughout the nineties and stuff. And you he's know, my he, heart throb he, now. He went on to be in a lot of movies. He's a great actor, and I think that it's unfortunate that his Bond gets a lot of flack because GoldenEye is a very tightly and well-written movie. I would say Tomorrow Never Dies and The World Is Not Enough are very fun and I very much like them. They're not quite as tightly written as this movie. And then I would say that Die Another Day is a movie that I enjoy, but has a lot of problems. So it's, it's kind of like Brosnan got the short end of the stick when it came to some of the writing. And because of that, some people don't remember his Bond as fondly as I think he deserves, especially when you're including stories like Agent Under Fire, Nightfire, and Everything or Nothing, like the video games. He's a very good Bond. He does a fantastic job. Bring back Brosnan! It's just frustrating to see how fantastic of a start Brosnan got, and then how he's kind of remembered as that guy who was in a bunch of Bond movies, but a lot of them didn't have that good a writing. That's frustrating to me because that's not his fault. He's great. And I think people are overly critical on his time as Bond. I think that's a shame, honestly. And I kind of think with you rewatching some of the movies, you'll probably go a little bit more easy on them, if, even if they have some problems. Because a lot of times as movies get older, uh, you kind of soften on them. You kind of understand like, ah, well, there's a couple of things wrong with it, but this was still really fun and enjoyable. Yeah. It's less of a big deal. And there are certainly James Bond movies with problems that I don't like nearly as much, uh, but I can't think of any off the top of my head that I just despise, including Die Another Day. Well, to wrap up my end of the review, I thought this movie was amazing. I'm really, really excited to see all the other Bond movies. Yeah, we waited to continue watching them because we didn't want to mess up our review. We want to watch it, then review it, so we don't mix in any elements of the other I, movies. I'm, I'm a big fan of like that intro and then outro scene with like the naked women dancing to Goldeneye the song. You're going to love the <laughs> intros to Bond, especially following Goldeneye, because they, they can continue to get more and more intricate. I'm really excited for it. I love like the weird music video um, and I'm very excited to see all of the rest of them and I'm excited to like you know have my on a top moment every single time I see Pierce Brosnan on screen. That makes sense. Hey, you're going to attack Pierce Brosnan with your thighs. I, well, you know what? I want to <laughs> add one last thing in here. Brosnan has some of the best one-liners in Bond history, and I love it so much. It's one of the things that made him so iconic, especially in this movie. Things like when he ends up like securing on a top to the helicopter and she gets squeezed to death in the trees. And he's like, she always liked a good squeeze <laughs> when, when that was her whole thing was squeezing men to death with her thighs and stuff. That was or, hilarious. Or when Jack asked if uh, Bond really trusted Natalia and if he had, had inspected her and he had just finished having sex with her on the beach and stuff. So he's like, I inspected her head to toe. You know, stuff like that. I just think that this Bond, you're going to see it in the video games as well. He has so many iconic one-liners and people are like, it's misogynistic nowadays. But like this character is so fun and has always been really fun. And I it was a product of its time. Well, I also don't find sex misogynistic. I, 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 I don't understand why anyone would. I, I've always honest. found sex appeal interesting. And I understand there's all these discussions about the male gaze and all that. I really don't care about any of that. Uh, to me, it's just not important um and i'm glad that there is this era of bond you know from classics all the way to no time to die where even though they do take some elements seriously and go different directions at times they're willing to still go into those things and not shy away from them i think following no time to die as just kind of wrapping up my opinion there is a lot of talks of where to take bond next that i'm very worried about because it seems like the idea in the writing room is to move the character further and further from the fun ideas of the brosnan era and i'm not really sure that i care that much about it you know i really care about the entire saga up through the end of no time to die but following that i'll just have to kind of see what they do yeah i mean there's also the problem of the james bond movies don't need to be an mcu you know, like, eventually they could just reboot it and have another James Bond like they always did and just have fun with it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always need to be Daniel Craig. We don't need to, like, do some weird passing the torch thing and have, like, a brand new Captain America sort of thing, but it's James Bond. Right. You know, I just kind of feel like they should just have fun with it. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I hope that's what they continue to do because I think having fun with it could have pretty much just been the tagline for Goldeneye, and that's probably why we loved it so much. Yes. So anyway, let us know what you think in the comments down below. 
what are some of your favorite James Bond movies? What are your thoughts? Do you have a favorite video game? And what kind of videos would you want to see on the character in the future? I've done, I know, two in the past. I have more coming up that I want to do. No, we're not becoming a James Bond channel. But again, there are certain cornerstones I kind of want to circle back to. Well, we've always reviewed movies on this channel. That's true. But like Bond is a cornerstone I do want to circle back to going mm -hmm. forward with games and movies. You know, along with the WB stuff, the Marvel stuff, the Fallout, Assassin's Creed, and even some Elder Scrolls, things like that. Spider-Man. No, 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 no. Let's move on. Have a fantastic day, everyone. Please leave a like and subscribe for more content if you enjoyed this video. And I do want to say a super special thank you to our patrons who make videos like this possible. Thank you very much to Jaden, Joypad Jake, Jason, Regular, Mark, Vince, Sean, Colin, and Javaris. You guys and, are very- and, In the Dark Nightmare, we need to always say thank you to him. Oh yeah, that's true. Thank you very much to the Dark Nightmare. It's been a little bit, so I, I almost forgot. But it is a big thank you. He's to him not as well. on our Patreon anymore because he's giving us money elsewhere on the Degenerate Plays membership channel, right? That's a good point. Yeah, but he was such a massive patron he, that he not he's, fat. He's one of our best friends. That's true. But he wasn't fat. We're sorry. Don't be mean. Have to a him. fantastic <laughs> day, and as always, everyone, stay shway.